Thank you, and, and thank you for uh, coming to this closing plenary where we will try to sum up and um, have some final very valuable points made by our distinguished panel. Um, I'd like to start by asking our panelists to, to come up to, on the stage. First, uh, Shinta Kamdani from the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Rodrigo Chavez, who is the Indonesia Country Director for the World Bank. Welcome. Thank you very much. Ambassador Stig Travik from the Norwegian Embassy. Nice to see you. I love your Mr. Bustar Maitar from Greenpeace International. Pak Hero Praseteo from the head of the Red Plus Agency. And Sarah Dixon Hoyle from the International Forestry Student Association. Let's give them a big hand. So, uh, we'll, now that we have everybody in place, uh, I thought we should proceed as follows. I will try to give you a, a short summary of some key points that uh, uh, the Secretariat of the conference has picked up during the last two days. And uh, based on that, and, and based on some questions that we have prepared for the panelists, they will get a chance to give their perspectives. And um, after that, we will see what the time is and, and uh, how much time we have for further discussion before we, we, we close the conference uh, formally. So, having said that, uh, I would like to recall that we set out to find commitments for research, for investments in sustainable landscapes, and for a continued dialogue on, on these issues. Uh, we've also structured our discussion pretty much around three basic themes. One being the post-2015 agenda and the sustainable development goals. Actually, we've seen an addition now uh, by Minister Pulga Vidal. He added the landscape development goals. I thought that was a very good idea. We'll see what we do with that. Um, the second theme has been climate change, of course, and, and the road towards a new climate agreement. And the third has been the discussion around the green economy. Um, we've had a process of this conference which started by us being very honored to have the President of Indonesia open the conference. We've had the honor of having 12 countries at ministerial level present who made many valuable interventions. We've had a couple of great keynotes today from Dr. Pachauri and Mark Burroughs. And we've had a number of high-level panels and discussion fora that have examined, really examined, the, land, the landscape approach and forests and, and how it all connects. And we've had a, value, a, a fantastic youth session, uh, which was very well attended. Um, not to speak about all the social events in between. So, we had a great process. Now, what did we talk about? I'll summarize this around the five themes that we had in today's panels. Those themes relate also to the discussion fora we had yesterday, and they also relate to the keynotes and to the uh, overall uh, uh, inputs that we have received during the conference. The first theme was about governance. And the, there was a lot of very interesting discussions about the challenges with the legal frameworks, the implementation of, of, uh, of that le such legal frameworks. We've had inputs on uh, related to the timber trade and the legality of that trade, how verification processes can, are evaluated and, and developed over time, um, and uh, the multi-layered arrangements of governance and what complications that means for, for the objectives that we're after. Um, we'll summarize this in much more detail in, in a forthcoming report from the conference, I'm just providing some highlights. A big theme has been investments. Um, and a couple of things to say about that is, one is that it's good to have finance people presence, because then you quickly realize that it has to be profitable, otherwise we can stop talking. Um, but it's also good that we've had the mix of finance and 
shall we say, natural resources or environment um, uh, disciplines present, because then you end up in, in, in the clear message that green economy doesn't necessarily mean less economy because it's green, nor does it mean that it's less green. It can actually be both more green and more economy in the end. I think that that's a key message out of this conference. We also heard related to investment that there is really a big pile of money out there. Exactly how big it is, we've heard some fantastic numbers. Um, but, and we also hear that there are changes happening in the private finance sector. They, or they, maybe we are part of it, the opportunities are now seen. There are many ethical considerations taken in, in large-scale investments. There are green bonds and other new financial products that are coming online. And we're also getting the message that to succeed, we probably need to think big in investment terms. Scale, scale, and scale seem to be the three key words. We also talked quite a bit on the role of public sector finance versus private sector finance, and maybe concluded that, to be realistic, we really need to look more and more to the private sector and make sure that the public sector provides the right enabling and framing and legal conditions for, for those uh, private sector finance. Um, we've heard comments on perverse incentives and subsidies that we need to clean up. We've heard about new landscape investment programs starting up. We've heard that there is a lot of need of evidence on how um, possible and profitable it is to invest uh, in the rural landscape and, and more research is needed. So that was the second theme. The third theme was on communities, landscapes and equity. Discussions have, have revolved around issues of capacities of local communities and indigenous peoples. It remains an issue. It remains to be a huge need to, to, um, to build capacity for the types of actions, investments, uh, uh, etc. that we are looking to. Dialogue remains essential for landscapes, for community forests, for integrated watershed management, or whatever we call it. Um, it has several names and, and it's not a new thing, but we still need to continue to build the dialogue. And then um, I read, I actually couldn't attend that particular session, but I, I also read from the notes that there's been some comments and critics that there hasn't always been so much progress over the past decades in, in these, around these concepts. And, and that might be a lesson to draw and, and, uh, and think about as, as we now move forward. A fourth, fourth theme was food security, or maybe we should call it food systems, not to confuse the concepts. Um, we talked about quantity versus quality. Are we on the right path in our food production? Um, I've learned a new word today that we might, we need perhaps to avoid an indomization, indomization of the diet. Means less noodles, I've learned. Um, we heard also from uh, particular Dr. Parchari in his keynote about the IPCC findings that the food system have, will have issues because of climate change and it's really time to connect the food and the climate um, uh, challenge as we move forward. And the, the uh, example of that was that we probably want to conclude from this conference that we also want coffee at our next conferences. The final theme, fifth theme, was climate change and biodiversity. Big message here is that adaptation and mitigation must come together and we must look at solutions more broadly. Again, from Dr. Bachari's keynote. We've also, we also continue to hear, maybe it's not so new, but we continue to hear that Red Plus is not only about the forests and also that Red Plus needs a context we think we are bringing some of that context in the discussions in this conference. Um, we also hear that the, there is a need to bring forests or mitigation action closer to finance, uh, to bring in perhaps 
ministers of finance in the discussion to a greater extent. Mm -hmm. This is all happening, but it's good to, to have it uh, confirmed. Um, and um, I think that, that, that comes to a close some of the highlights from the different themes. Coming back to the commitments, I think we heard lots of commitments. I would like to highlight two, which I thought was very well pronounced, were very well pronounced. Um, one was a um, minister from Brunei, who very clearly listed the commitments that Brunei was prepared to take. So that was very valuable. Another commitment that we saw illustrated was the presentation done by um, the uh, uh, representative from Philippines, from the Dep Department of Environment and Natural Resources. He actually illustrated a lot of commitments made for the landscapes of the Philippines and the expansion of the forests and, and uh, uh, along the lines of the themes of this conference. Very encouraging. There were many more commitments. I just wanted to highlight these two. Um, some other key points from, from, uh, from my notes that was that the haze issue was one of the precursors of this conference. And sure enough, this continues to be a very um, high attention topic for all of us in this region. And we've heard several speakers refer to it, uh, particularly our MC, who's not here anymore, but she mentioned her school days in Singapore, how they were disturbed by the haze. Now, this is, the haze issue is really serious, but I would like to say that one thing it has led to is also that it has worked as a way to bring topics together that would otherwise perhaps not be so easy to discuss at the same time. Because the Hayes problem really illustrates a number of things. It illustrates governance issues, it illustrates investment issues that may not be exactly as we want them. It illustrates the climate change issues in terms of emissions, it illustrates ecosystem losses, and it illustrates how the food systems that we have at the moment are operating. So it's a good topic, and, and sorry, and also the health issues that, that, that are the result of it. So it really is a topic that has helped to bring together um, disciplines um, in this conference. I brought one line from the two keynotes today, Mark Burroughs and Dr. Prachauri. Mark talked about a perception gap and the need for us to bridge these different disciplines and make sure that we understand each other. It's a surprising level of misunderstandings when uh, investment bankers talk to uh, conservation uh, um, professionals. And, and we, we need to continue to close that perception gap to make progress. And I would say that Dr. Pachauri talked about the knowledge gap. Yes, we know a lot more now from the IPCC reports, but the knowledge gaps are still daunting, both in terms of what's going on, secondly, what actions we have to choose from, and finally, the consequences of those actions. Um, this brings me to another point, which also illustrated by the two keynotes today. I think we've managed to bring the finance community and the broadly speaking, environment community more together through this conference. I think this is an important achievement and I think we should be proud of that, having talked to each other. Um, being the head of a research organization, I have to say that we have also figured out many new and exciting opportunities for science and research that we will now pick up on. Another key point um, was that we've had discussions around the climate change narrative, and that it needs to perhaps change, it needs to be framed in a more positive way. It needs to be framed to see the opportunities in investments, for example, in land use, to deal with the issues and not only be portrayed as, as, as a problem and a limitation. Looking forward, finally, um, Minister Pulgar Vidal, the incoming COP president has described to us a fairly rough road ahead towards Paris, via Bonn, New York, Lima, New York again, and many other places. And the many things that need to come together if we're indeed going to have a successful climate agreement next year. 
Same goes for the post-2015 agenda. <coughs> um, and I think by that I'll conclude my own quick summary of the things we've heard and seen from the conference. I hope that gave you some more thoughts in the panel on, on your reflections. I'd like, and I'd like to give each of the panelists a chance to say a few words. I'm going to sit down over there, so you don't have to come here if you don't want to, but it's up to you. Okay. Um, to start with, um, Shinta. I just need to find the right page of my notes. Um, Shinta, you really represent a big part of the Indonesian private sector that, that is engaged in the issues, and, and we are really curious now to hear your your conclusions and your reflections of the conference and what you will do next, please. Thank you, Peter. And um, I think if, if, when we see the last two days, we can see that the, the session of uh, green growth is aligned and wholly supportive by engaging stakeholders to deliver change, both at national and provincial level. The private sector plays a, a big role in maintaining overall investment level, foreign direct investment, as well as domestic direct investment, whether from retained earnings or financial markets and financial institution. In doing sustainable business, private sector also requires strong institutional setup through which policies that will establish a model and a green growth development. As has been said, private sector have ought to do a sustainable, sustainable business in order to working for the future and balancing the community and environment. Investor driving transformation towards sustainability and guide benefits in green returns. And green investment for us is one of the tools and could be done by three ways in sustainable natural assets, expanding natural assets, and creating green jobs. Yet, private sector could not do this sustainable business alone. There are many challenges such as overlapping concession, licenses, market uncertainty, forests and pit fires, community rights. Green growth needs to develop into a broad-based broad social movement. We, the private sector, need public support. We need no deforestation commitment from all party funding and investment that focus on landscape conservation. Building the technological capacity and market recognition or even innovating market to support sustainability. Innovative approaches should be implemented to financing the inclusive green returns. For land investment, property, agriculture, extractive industry, and infrastructure, a greater awareness of land tenure problems among risk professionals and insurance providers may create incentive, increasing financing costs, and less of insurance that protects against careless investment in land for these businesses, land investment areas, managing financing costs. In particular, sustainable landscape is worth enough to build in effort to sustain the business itself. Towards an effective business balance of public and private capital, climate finance has been a key to resulting a significant commitment to increase the flow of climate finance from developed to developing countries. In improving private sector and smallholder participation, private standards have the potential to result in positive effects and lead to positive impact both at the producer and at the supply chain level. Successful implementation private standard requires a balance between global scope and adaptation to local conditions. In improving performance in sustainable palm oil and timber, private sector should tra transform, and some of the private sector have announced uh, their commitment, for zero deforestation, no development on peat, 
respect to people and local community and transparency. For that purpose, government have to supervise and work closely with companies, growers, traders, processor, NGO, financial institution, and so forth. We, as the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce, would like to make our commitment of, first, to continue engaging with the key stakeholders and learning while also moving further into the role of resource provider and educate. We pledge to aggregate and make available key resources and help develop capacity around this key area. Community participation and recognition, effective spatial planning, mapping, and the One Map Initiative, and improving practices among small and medium agriculture enterprises. Second, we will continue to leverage our natural role as a representative of the private sector to learn from our members and our experience and provide actionable recommendation to policymaker so that policy more effectively support equitable, low carbon, and sustainable development. Third, in the medium term, aim to find opportunities to demonstrate these improved practices and invest in sustainable landscape through improved practices and planning. To implement collaborate ma mapping and spatial plan planning, pilot use of best practices, bringing all stakeholders together to learn, raise awareness, and create a shared vision. We at Tadin very much look forward to working with all leaders to facilitate collaborate approaches to addressing these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Jinta. Is this now on or not on? Not on. It's not on? Now it's on. Somebody's doing something over there. Thank you very much, Jinta. Uh, that's a great conclusion from, from um, uh, the representative, you as a representative from the private sector. Now I would like to turn to Rodrigo Chavez. Rodrigo, you're, you're the head of the World Bank here. And uh, I mentioned the Minister of Finance before and that we need to start talking to them. I think you talk to them all the time. And, and we have a question for you. And that, that is, relates to the forests. And through, through its forest investment program, the World Bank is providing significant support to the so-called KPH. Mm -hmm. These are the new forest management units in Indonesia. And they're designed to improve coordination of the forest management. So the question is what, how the World Bank is involved. What are the steps that you are taking to ensure that these forest management units will bridge the current gaps and ensure that forests are managed sustainably across sectors? In what ways are these capihas and the forest investment program following a landscapes approach? Okay. Please. Um, could, is this one? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, and congratulations on what is obviously a very great event. I was told that this was the session on commitments, and before answering your question, let me do what uh, uh, I would like to do, which is let there be no doubt that the World Bank in Indonesia is fully uh, committed to work with this great country, the government and the civil society of this country, in protecting uh, one of the most uh, wonderful creations of modern nature and an amazingly valuable asset and managing that asset in a sustainable, socially inclusive and economically rational way. That, as you mentioned earlier before, is a big task and it requires a lot of things to achieve what could be said so simply in a few words, manage an asset. As I said, it's an extremely complex asset, and it would require a lot of action, public policy action, Ibu Shinta mentioned uh, private sector action. It requires understanding what is the trade-off between agriculture and forest, extraction and livelihoods, uh, good governance, law enforcement, and the like. Uh, in the context of the commitment that the World Bank has made, and reiterates today here to Indonesia, we have been asked to take on a small piece, comparatively speaking, yet a potentially important piece, 
which is uh, the issue of setting up instruments of governance at the local level that uh, in Indonesia they would be called uh, forestry management units. Uh, these are in the, that's the translation to English. And in Indonesian is KPHAS. And these units are going to put one of the pieces of the whole puzzle. And as such, they are not going to be, nor could they be expected to be uh, the sufficient condition to manage and protect the forests of this country. They are a necessary condition. And these units are going to be at the level of local gov government. Uh, and they will have four key areas of focus that I think are obvious in the context, obviously important in the context of the conversations that you had earlier today. These CAPEHAS are going to clearly define what are the boundaries of the asset that uh, is being managed, protected, and so on. Clear physical definition. That's the piece of land with the forests on it and the biodiversity on it and the people on it that we are going to manage. That would be quite an improvement. The second part is they will work in defining what are the rights, who has the rights, and what are the appropriate uses of the land, of the land, of the asset being informed. And Finally, the fourth element is that they are going to work with the stakeholders, the parties interested in that asset, be it the local community, be it the private sector for profit, be it the state as a good arbitrator and uh, as the regulator of economic activity in this country. And they are going to try to precisely provide elements into governance, and elements who, which should and could be enforced as part of the law enforcement. And that's the contribution of the CAPEHAS. It is an instrument. It's a piece in a big puzzle. What we are doing, uh, as I said before, the World Bank uh, does what Indonesia, in the broader sense of the word Indonesia, government, society, and so on, uh, is called to do upon. And we were called to contribute together with our friends at the IDB, ADB, Asia Development Bank, and the IFC, uh, an amount uh, that is not uh, small of resources to get this CAPEHAS design installed and going. Uh, we hope that together with the private sector again, the international community, the government, the civil society, the local people at the forests, this will contribute. And I would like to close uh, this brief intervention with what I said at the beginning. Uh, let there be no mistake, we are fully committed as an institution. I, am, I happen to be a Costa Rican, which is a tiny little place in the world where we may have done a couple of good things regarding the environment and uh, is in our DNA to protect that amazing creation to manage, it's not protect, to manage rationally, socially inclusive and in an economic way that makes sense, uh, the forest. So I am also personally committed and great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo, for those thoughtful and kind words. Now, I'm turning to Ambassador Trovik, Stig. Thank you for being here. You, your first commitment, I think, has been to be very present at this conference. We have been very happy to have you here. And talking about commitments, I don't think we, we have uh, anyone as committed as Norway when it comes to the issues we're talking about. Um, so besides reflecting on, on, on the conference as such, um, I would like to hear some views when we pit, now put the private finance sector next to, shall we say, the Red Plus issues. And we 
all are aware of the discussion when it comes to red, where did the private finance go? And now maybe we have an opportunity uh, to, to move forward on that. So it would be interesting to hear your views on that perspective um, and, and uh, how we can possibly ensure that funding for existing and new Red Plus initiatives can, can be secured in Asia, but also worldwide. Steve, please. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Peter. Um, and thank you for organizing this very uh, successful uh, conference. Um, I think, uh, Speak. I think you is it working? Move, yeah. move it, yeah. Just move it up to your mouth, I think. Pull it up? Yeah. I think the, the most important thing, and that I think that comes from, in a way, uh, the title of the conference, looking at the landscapes. I think you've done extremely well in drawing people together. Uh, so to de-silo a bit the, the discussions, uh, because I think there tends to be silo uh, discussions. So I think that we've had very good messages of hope on the global level, level from the Peruvian uh, minister. I think we, we need that. I think President SPY pointed to the importance of regional cooperation. I think you've pointed out the importance of cross-sectoral uh, cooperation in government and the triangle of course government, civil society and private, uh, private sector. I think you've done extremely well in that. And yes, I mean, we are committed to, uh, to stay, uh, stay the course. I think on finance, I think the best guarantee for success is to demonstrate that we are succeeding here. And I think Pajero and his uh, team, they are in the, the process of uh, proving, uh, proving that we can and will uh, produce success stories. Um, <clears throat> I think, in a way, there, there is a bad and a, and a good side to where we are at. This being a year of transition also in Indonesia. In one sense, you could say, it's unfortunate that we haven't been able to do even more during the years we had a commitment. The good thing is, of course, that 95% of the funding is available to the incoming government. So I'm pretty certain that we will be able to work as well with the incoming government as we've done with the, the sitting government. Um, I think another important thing here, I mean, you need hope and boldness. You need finance. Uh, you need technology and entrepreneurship. But you also need knowledge, and I think that's where C4 has something very uh, important. Let me just share one little story about you, with you about how wrong it can go. If you have both hope, boldness, finance, technology, entrepreneurship, but not knowledge. Uh, the Vikings were very uh, good at inventing things. They invented the best boats of their, uh, their age. They had the finance to travel uh, far. They had the boldness, they had the entrepreneurship to set up farms. So they went all the way to Greenland. What they didn't realize was that they didn't have the knowledge about the landscapes of Greenland. So they expanded, they expanded, and then suddenly somebody cut down the last tree. And from there it went very quickly downhill. So the, uh, we expanded there for 300 years. And then it took 50 years before you had to, uh, to leave the place because of lack of knowledge. So I hope that that is uh, something that you are providing us with here. So let us to make sure that we are not going to be those Vikings. <laughs> it's a good analogy. I guess that's why they called it Greenland as well. That was lack of knowledge. Well, it was actually very green at the, at the time when they, they arrived. Less so when they left. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Steve. Um, Bustar, you represent Greenpeace International. Yeah. And uh, we all know about Greenpeace global campaigns, and you've been very successful in uh, convincing mm -hmm. companies to employ more sustainable yeah, business yeah. models. And we have some recent examples of that here in Indonesia. Um, so, it would be valuable to hear your views, both generally on, on the, uh, the um, movements and, and interests and, and successes 
from your perspective mm -hmm. of the private sector and also your reflections on, on the topic of the conference. Yeah. So, please, yeah. the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. And also, thank you very much for Sivor to inviting us as a Greenpeace here. It's not the, as usual as Greenpeace sitting in the panel like this. Usually we're sitting in the back with the banner, <laughs> but I'm here now. So, <laughs> so that is our core business, to asking people to do more, including government and the private sector. Otherwise, banner will be hanging in the back. So, <laughs> Greenpeace in Indonesia, we start the office here uh, about more or less nine years ago. And then I've been watching uh, the whole development of the forestry uh, sector in Indonesia. And then at the time, I think about even seven or five years ago, when people talking about the moratorium on deforestation, it's haram in Indonesia. So no one is want to talk about moratorium because it's something people thinking impossible. But what is happening in 2010, then President SBY come up with the idea of the moratorium and everybody surprised. So, and this is something is really encouraging and together with the Norwegian government signed a deal for supporting Indonesia for the uh, moratorium. So not only about moratorium, but what is what most important thing is the how to define the whole forestry sector here in Indonesia to be a better managed, good for people, good for economy, but also good for uh, uh, environment. And this is also part of the uh, Greenpeace commitment. Many people thinking that Greenpeace is uh, campaigning to stop palm oil, but here I would like to uh, repeat again, Greenpeace position is not anti-palm oil. That is our global position. This, is some, this commodity is important for the local people here in Indonesia. So, reflection from the, from the uh, uh, conference, what I hear from yesterday, yesterday in the first panel you hear uh, uh, Frankie Vijaya. So, what I would say here, Again, a couple of years ago, people saying no deforestation is impossible. Even people tell me, Busta, you're crazy. What you're asking for, no deforestation is crazy. But what is happening now, Golden Agri Resources, 2011, make a commitment, no deforestation, palm oil. You know? Following after that, Asia Pulp and Paper making a commitment, no deforestation, uh, pulp and paper. And then uh, we have also example of uh, a restoration company who can get the permission here in Indonesia without, you know, without giving any single money under the table, uh, RMU, here, and this is something that big success. So what this means, Wilmar recently, just last year, uh, the Forest Trust and also uh, uh, Climate Advisor together making a Wilmar also for no deforestation. So no deforestation is not illusion. It's something real can be happen on the ground, and this is can be implemented for the business here in Indonesia. So if I hear any business saying no deforestation is impossible, I'm saying don't bullshitting me because there is a there is an example about more or less 40 companies globally now is making commitment for no deforestation including, for example, recently uh, uh, Procter & Gamble, market company, many companies growing. So demand for no deforestation product is growing. Uh, if you're talking about Indonesia, I mean, this is a very good time now we have this conference. I mean, the, uh, the election uh, 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 in Indonesia is happening now, and we're talking about the leg legacy. Uh, yesterday, President SBY, SBY is making a, a strong commitment, and what Greenpeace would like to see before SBY is leaving the palace is the, to have place full protection on peatland. This is something is really concrete to stop emission, especially coming from the peatland. Peatland protection also is a long-term solution for the forest fire. Why? Because if you dry, drain its peatland, means you prepare a fuel for the next forest fire. For the, those of, of the people who's, who know of peatland, when the peatland is very dry, it's very easy to burn. So when you dry peatland, means you prepare a fuel for the uh, next forest fire. So better to protect those peatland. When we when we talking about uh, campaigning on no deforestation, some companies saying, "What you mean about forest? Because here in Indonesia, 
the terminology of forest sometimes is the uh, different in the each sector. So we come out with the something that we call it high carbon <coughs> stock to really define what is the graded forest, what is the good forest, to give a clear line to the company that where they can develop palm oil and where they, they should protect a forest. And this is something that is already applied in Golden Agri Resources uh, 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 company, in Asia Palm and Paper, in Wilmar, to helping them to define which area they can develop and which area they should, they should, uh, they should protect. And of course also I really appreciate uh, uh, Ibu Sinta. I mean, you mentioned that the commitment for uh, business sector so now I think it's the time to really making a, a change. Uh, example is there, commitment from the uh, donor country is there, commitment from the government of Indonesia is there. So, you know, there is no, nothing to excuse anymore. Now it's time to making a, a, a concrete. But also here that the, it's really important to give incentive to the company, to the people, including the small farmers who want to do best practices. Otherwise, doing good, doing bad, all the same. So this is something that we need to differentiate. Who's doing good? Of course, we need to, I mean, government is need to give incentive, to give appreciation. Uh, market also should appreciate that, you know, uh, and then by supporting the, their product and that kind of thing. So this is uh, uh, something uh, important. Previously, I keep hearing about the green economy, low carbon economy, or whatever it is. Now, uh, what I would like to introduce, what, uh, what I would like to say is the no deforestation economy. Something that we can measure really clear in the next two years that no more deforestation in fourth. Yesterday, uh, in the media, Indonesia is one of the top ten uh, global economy now. And this is happening during the moratorium time. So what this means, Growing economy while trying to remain as our natural resources is something uh, impossible. So that is my takeaway. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. I offer to you. Thank you, Booster. I, I was worried there for a while because you, you, you were so successful, so I was wondering what Greenspeace is going to do now. But th then you came back, so you have plenty of work to do still. <laughs> Um, okay, I think it's now time to hear from, from our host government. Paquero, head of the Red Plus Agency, it's a pleasure to have you here as always. And, and we look forward to hear, hear your views, particularly the way forward for the agency, the cross-sectoral work and everything. Okay. Please. Can I use the phone? Absolutely. I'm not very comfortable with this. <laughs> 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 yes, yes. You feel like Madonna. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm put in a very difficult position here. Rodrigo mentioned this is a time to make commitments. How can I make commitments when my president has made such a strong commitment on the first day? Cannot top that. And also, you're talking about uh, moving forward, Peter, in terms of what we are going to do to moving to the front. I will try to answer that, but let me give you my reflection of the two days. Some people say that life begins at 40. And I think we start the life again since 40 years ago. In 1972, mark my word, 1972 is not 40 years from now. In Stockholm, people say that in the conference that was a before the Earth Summit in, the, in Rio, that if we continue this path of ignorance and negligence, a very bad thing is going to happen to this planet. That was 1972. And then people talk about that. 1992, we have the uh, Earth Summit, and then after the Earth Summit, you have the UN FCCC, you have UNCBD, you have UNCCD as if the solution of the planet problems and climate change and other things can be solved with separate silos. <laughs> it does, in terms of getting to the clarity of the matter, the scientific analysis of that, but it's time now to converge again. So when we are talking about forests since Montreal to Bali to the next uh, Copenhagen and others, we are now back to landscape. 
Because when you're talking about those negligence, those ignorance, we are talking about landscape. In 1972, landscape was the agenda. And now we are back to landscape as an agenda. Why I mentioned 40 years? Because the idea of landscape was brought to the front in the year 2012. That was in Doha. So 40 years, now we are two years into the time when we are getting back to the roots of the issue, to the roots of the solution, finding the solution to the root of the issue. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that when President mentioned about sustainable growth with equity, we were talking about a several criteria, several indicators that we need to address. Emission is one of those criteria. Emission is one of those uh, indicators to address, but not only that, we also need to address the issue of growth. We need to address the issue of development. We need to address the issue of governance. We need to address the issue of equity and inclusiveness. Those are the things that, in my opinion, is what the president meant, our president mentioned yesterday. And I think that has to come in a way that is properly done here. The reflection of the two days that I have been around here and listening, both the noise and the voice, both the sound, the concern, solution, thoughts, as well as complaint and protest, was actually something that goes into the two areas, the substantive things, what needs to be done and what can we do about it, and when do we start action on that, and the other side is talking about how do we actually fund that. How can we actually channel the resources that, to make that happen? We understand the discussion about the public fund, the private investment, the private fund, and all those things. Let me reflect on that and discuss that on a metaphor of the flow of water. On the top end, you have the upstream. That is where the fund can come from. In the middle, you have the dam. And then after the dam, you have the downstream, where the money or whatever the resources is, is going to be applied such that the whole objective of achieving sustainable growth with equity is uh, uh, happening, not only happening, but also work. What are those things that we consider to be flowing into the dam? And where are they in the terms of things? Let's look into this. Where is the supply and where is the demand? Because always you will have to have the flow. Talking about funds, you're saying that the supply will come from the private sector, will come from the donor country, so to speak, the developed country, and get into a mechanism that will now get into the forested country for distribution and for the development in the right way. But let's think about it on the reverse side. You have the painting of Asher, whereby the, the stairs goes up and the down at the same time. The carbon, what we are, the emission that we reduce, the reduction of the impact to the climate change that we happen in these countries, the forested country, is actually a supply that can ask for the demand for the fund to pay for it. So actually, you're talking about two kinds of flow, the flow of resources and the flow of results. And these two flow needs to be balanced. It is not proper to just discuss the flow of funds to finance, to develop the outcome, which is the reduction of emission, the development in an equitable basis, and then there is no demand. What is the point of having a certification if there is no differentiation on the price of your commodity? So you are talking about the flow of the results to the demand as the being the supply, and the supply of fund, I will say fund in the general terms, to feed the development so that that will create the product. That is a metaphor that you are talking about, the flow, and the flow can only happen if there is a difference in height if there is a difference in level so that it can flow, which means what? The demand needs to be as high or higher than the supply to get this flow continuously moving. Look into that. 
we, the developed country, we, the de sorry, we, the deforested country, will say when you're talking about Red Plus, when you're talking about funds on the sustainable landscape for the green growth, we are the supplier of the solution for the climate change. Where is the resources that will make us able to supply? That is the equation that needs to be addressed. All right, that is in terms of the flow. But when you're talking about funds here, I'm not talking about money alone. I'm talking about funds, the skills, the capacity, the expertise that is already being developed somewhere else, and also the time and attention. If those flow is not, ha is not having all this element, if there is no expertise, no flow of resources, if there is no time and attention from the develop con developing country for producing that results, there is no flow again. So this is a flow not only of money, but also of expertise, flow of technology, and flow of time and attention. I am just continuing this from my last landscape meeting, when landscape is only landscape, and it is going to be silent, it's going to be quiet, if there is no flow considered that. The flow of money, the flow of goods, the flow of people, and the flow of technology and knowledge. They are an uh, integral part of the analysis on landscape. And that is what I reflect listening to the various speakers during these two days. And then we have come a full circle and beyond. Why I mention that beyond? Because in this conference, I will ask myself, if I do this conference in Accra, will we have the same agenda? If we have this conference in Lima, will we have the same agenda? And I think 85% of the agenda will be the same, and 15% will be specific to the locations, because this is a global problem that will call for global solution. But what is that plus? This conference normally have a lot of aged people like me. But this one, we have youth with us. And that is so important to me. Because I always say in a meeting whereby youth is present, because they are very important, one day, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to knock on your gate and ask, dear leaders of the day, am I allowed to get in? Have I done good for your future, or have I done bad, so that you can refuse me to enter your world? And I hope when that time comes, the youth will say, oh yeah, you have been in that conference in Jakarta, right? And because of that, I will welcome you all to be the citizen of the future, because that is what sustainable landscape for green growth is all about. It's about the future, it's about the generation that is to come and to come and to come. Not only 25 years, not only 40 years, but forever. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Many thanks, Bakiero. Um, I hope we will change more than 15% over time, <laughs> but we will see. Now, we, for the last uh, intervention in this uh, closing uh, panel, we saved that for the future. And the future is here represented by the International Forestry Students Associ Association and the SARA. And um, Pakiro gave you a very nice pitch here. So <laughs> now is, the floor is yours to, to, to pick it up. So I'm going to stand as well. We're young, we like to do things differently. Thank you. So we welcome you knocking on our doors in the future. You said though that life starts at 40. I would respectfully say that it starts much younger and I'm happy to see that the youth voice is alive and really strong here today at Forest Asia. I'd like to make four key points today. Firstly, for those of you who don't know, last night we had a really dynamic and exciting youth session. We took a whole new approach in terms of designing it, and we produced really concrete, actionable outcomes. Number two, these outcomes are in the form of commitments for addressing forestry challenges, but also recommendations as to how you can support youth into the future. 
The third point I want to make is that integrated solutions require a new way of thinking. And this is where we see young people being able to come in. And the last point I'll make is that we, as young people, are key stakeholders in many of the issues that we're looking at here today. And we need to be better integrated into future events and policy dialogues. So on my first point, the youth session, over 120 people, a mix of students, young professionals, and also senior professionals, perhaps young at heart, came to this event. We broke into groups run by our youth moderators, and we ran discussions on topics that related to the summit themes. It was so exciting seeing how interactive and participatory and engaging the session was. Um, and I see we're here on a panel, one of the things we're talking about is dialogue. Well, I see the youth session as being dialogue in one of its truest forms. After two days of this summit, I look at you and ask you, what engages you? What challenges you to think differently? What inspires you to come up with new ideas? Do you really just want to hear more statistics? Are you really looking forward to another standard PowerPoint presentation? Or do you want something new and different? If nothing else, I would say that everyone here could learn something from this new and exciting approach of young people. We came up with so many insightful and actionable commitments. I can't go through all of them here today, but I just want to highlight two key points that we raised. In the climate space, young people are already engaging on many fronts, from high-level policy and advocacy all the way down to the grassroots level. And we are committed to continuing to work to build our skills and our knowledge and to seek opportunities to help us to continue to engage in these projects in the future. However, we need support. And one recommendation that I thought was really interesting was the need for provision of seed funds for youth-driven climate change projects so that young people have a chance to learn on the job and test our own solutions. We're also committed to using our networks and social media to target campaigns and actions for green investment. But we need mentors. So another recommendation was that experts from existing forums, such as the ASEAN Economic Community, work with existing youth groups as mentors to help build our understanding of the most pressing green investment issues um, and also helping us make informed and coherent policy recommendations. But what else can we contribute? I think one of the key messages or questions that we've been asking over these past two days is how can we come up with a different paradigm or different approach to growth and development? Well, this requires change, and change requires something new. Yes, it requires new science and new commitments, but in my mind, it requires a whole new way of thinking. We often get told as young people that we need more knowledge, more experience, before we can actually contribute in any meaningful way. Well, I would say, even if we don't necessarily know more, perhaps our unique way of approaching problems and thinking about things is just what everyone here needs in order to fundamentally change our way of thinking. The other point I wanted to make is there's a danger of youth being boxed in as some homogenous group and kept off to the sidelines. But we're so much more than just youth. We're students. I know there's a large group of students in the audience today. And we want to have a say in the future of our forestry education. We're also, as has been highlighted, the next generation of forestry professionals. So we have a key stake in any projects or discussions on capacity building. And like many of you, we're part of our local communities. And I think that youth have the capacity to work as a bridge between these communities and between government and the private sector to help work towards ensuring equitable development and benefit sharing. I want to thank C4 for the support they've given to youth. But I also want to question, is having purely a separate sideline youth session really the best way that we can integrate a young voice 
into the discussions today. I think it was fantastic seeing our young moderator, Yi Ying. I don't know where she's gone, but it was great seeing that young presence all throughout today as an MC. And I would ask, where are the young panelists? Where are the young rapporteurs? Where are the young representatives in all these areas that I've just mentioned? How can we better integrate youth across the entire event and policy dialogue? I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I did want to share a quote with you. Um, many of you will know of Jack Westerby, a former FAO forester. And he closed an Australian Timber Congress back in the 60s, well before I was born, by putting to the audience, this is an old Congress, and I think you need to work to make sure that the next one is not an old Congress. Some of you are managers, some of you are directors, it would pay your companies better to have you spend a week on the golf course and to send one of your youngsters instead. So I'll leave this as a challenge to you and also get you to ask, how can you commit to supporting youth in forestry into the future? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I will make a commitment right away. For the, next, for, the, for the next conference, we will lower the medium age of the panels by 10 years. <laughs> okay, I, I would like to give an opportunity to all of the panelists, if you have uh, heard something that you would like to comment as, as a final remark before we move on with the agenda. Shinta, you were first. You have had a long time to reflect now. Do you have anything you would like to comment on at the end? Mm. I just think it's, it's, you know, it's important that we see this effort being done together. And I think, you know, uh, hearing from the youth side, and I was hoping we can also have the Indonesian youth here. I don't know whether there are any here. But I think bringing them in is a very big uh, component because we are talking about the future. And I think we are the private sectors and NGOs and the government, we always look at ourselves from, on, on, from um, different wavelengths, you know. And I think um, it's important that this, again, the stress of the importance of the collaboration and how we can uh, view the long term and um, invest, basically, for our future. Great, thank you. Any, any other panelists want to come in at this point? I have to answer your question. Absolutely. Uh, I have not answered your question, right? In terms of how do we work together tomorrow uh, to ensure that the so-called perce perceived silo, perceived or real, is uh, being breached. You see, I, I went, I went meet with the ministries, and I understand that actually at heart and the intent and the thinking is toward an integrated approach, but they are trapped in the system. And so when I offer that we work together, consolidate the good things that has been done, and put into the right track for Red Plus achievement, as the President promised, I get a very, very positive response. And I think that is not only happening with the ministries or the agencies, but that also happens with the NGOs and others. So I am very, very much optimistic, cautious as it has, that the future we can work together and with this kind of uh, response from the community, uh, the, the job that has to be done, which is very complex, is not something that is not unsurmountable. We can still do it, but only if we do it together. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe Rodrigo. The more I think about this, is this one? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, it is obvious what Pajero and Ibushinta just mentioned, right? No particular dimension of the solution or element into what we want to achieve regarding uh, forest and landscapes can be tackled by one institution, let alone one individual, cannot be tackled by a government, 
cannot be tackled by the private sector alone. Can, it's, it's a system uh, that moves together. And what I think Pajero say, we went uh, in circles and so on, we have been as, uh, as a group of people interested in this, talking about this for years. And we always leave something behind. Something that in itself might not look important, that in itself is obviously not sufficient, but that prevented the reductions of the rate of deforestation, the sustainability, whether it's social conflict because nobody thought about the, the rights and, and, and the presence of indigenous people, or whether somebody didn't think, didn't think about the enforcement of a particular regulation. So that, I think that this attitude that nobody can solve it, nobody meaning no institution, no government, no sector of society by itself, it's a great contribution. The other part is that, again, forests don't exist in isolation. Societies want to grow, want to grow richer, want to be more prosperous, right? But, and, and there are people who have uh, the desire to develop uh, you know, their livelihoods and so on. So this is a problem that has to be worked by all together, and it is an important, such an important problem that there is no other option but to reach across and get it done. And I, I'm very excited to see that you managed to achieve this conversation and this conference, Peter. Congratulations. Yeah, I think uh, maybe last thing from me, I, I would like to, I mean, now is the couple of companies already making move, and uh, 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 also here I would like to put open invitation for the other business sector to making any more move. Uh, I saw, for example, April here. Uh, I invite April now to become uh, another no deforestation company. I would like to see that soon, and uh, I see another uh, as a business as here also. So no, we need more. If we're talking about landscape, for example, APP just announced one million hectares landscape approach for the conservation. And uh, we're talking about Bukit Tiga Pulu, for example, or Kampar Peninsula. It's not only one company there. There's a lot of companies. There is a palm oil company, there is a local people, indigenous people, and that kind of thing. And this is something that we need to work together. Everybody should work together to working on landscape, otherwise there is no, there is no uh, landscape. Making sure the indigenous people right is there, so you know people can can making sure they feel safe when they're working together as a, you know in the landscape in the landscape level. So I think opportunities now, and now is the time the time to to act. No more you know no more talking. I think no more talking. Doing something more on the ground. I I believe the youth want to see more trees is safe. They don't want to. President SBY yesterday inviting to counting trees that he already planned. I expect we can counting that, so in the next year, the youth can say, oh, there is a 50 trees is lost. So where's the 50 trees? <laughs> okay, Steve. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to, is this on? Yeah, the, it's, it's on. I just wanted to follow up a little bit on, on what uh, Rodrigo said and maybe uh, also pa Pajero in terms of uh, funding uh, mechanisms because I think there are two, two issues uh, in a way. One is the level of funding available, which is one problem that needs to be tackled. I think also, I mean, in terms of the mechanisms, the toolbox we have, those tend to be siloized as well. So there tends to be funding for private sector, there tends to be funding for agriculture, there tends to be funding for forest. But for landscapes, there has been very, very little. So together with uh, our friends in the US and the UK and the World Bank, we set up something called the Biocarbon Fund Initiative, which is supposed to fund landscape level uh, uh, programs, where uh, there's an opening for collaborations between civil society, private sector, local governments. So, of course, my hope is that we will be the most advanced here in Indonesia. So the first program coming on stream in this global initiative will be here in Indonesia. So let's make that happen. Now you have the chance to have the last word again. Sarah. I just wanted to make um, a brief comment. So I said something about we need a new way of thinking and approaching things. And I think this landscapes approach is one new way of thinking. 
Um, and I think it's really great that we're having this conversation across sectors and stakeholders. I think it's really important. I went to a session on forestry education and I haven't yet seen this way of thinking or a landscapes perspective integrated into forestry education and skills training. And so if we're wanting a future of forestry professionals that are able to manage our forests and landscapes, I think it's really important that everyone here who works in universities, research institutes, anything that has a capacity building role for youth actually starts to have that conversation and starts to, I guess, increase the awareness of these new approaches so that we can actually take on this challenge in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you, and thank you to the whole panel. Let's give them a hand. So, um, we're coming to a close. Um, before we do that, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the Forest Asia partners. Um, First of all, our host country partner, the Ministry of Forestry of Indonesia, and our coordinating partner, Global Initiatives. Your support has really been essential throughout the planning and, and, and the whole development of this summit. Really? Okay. Thanks. Secondly, our funding partners, You're the one field they've there. ensured that we can provide all the logistics and the services and the food and the coffee still for a conference of, of this size. Thanks to Australian aid, USAID, NORAD, DFID, lots of acronyms here, CRP, FTA, whatever that means, uh, European Union, it's a, C, it's a CGIR, C for acronym, I know exactly what it means. So I'm, I'm not offending anyone, that's my point. Um, European Union, German Corporation, and the CGIR Fund. And another important thank you to our supporting partners who have helped to support the special sessions throughout the whole conference. Aqua Danon, ASEAN Korean Forest Corporation, Credit Suisse, Demeter, IBCSD, Cadin Indonesia, UN Environment Program, and the World Agroforestry Center. Thanks also to our media partners um, who have publicized and promoted this event. Verita Sato, Green Radio, and Compass. Finally, thank you to all our session organizers, exhibitors, the Landscape Issues Marketplace presenters, and to all participants of the summit. I think we should give all of us and all of you a collective thank you. And as it happens, I will not have the final word. Instead, I would like to invite Agus Pernomo, from, who is from the Council of Climate Change in Indonesia and works for, for the Office of the President, to come up and have the final word. Agus, please. Thank you, Peter. Distinguished guests, participants of the Forest Asia Summit 2014, we now come to the close of what has been, by all accounts, by all testimonies, a successful and productive discussion. It is my pleasure, my honor, to make a closing remarks and express our gratitude, the government of Indonesia gratitude to all those who have contributed, who have sharing knowledge, best practices from the ground on better managing its forests, landscapes, and to contribute on the regional experiences to accelerate the shift toward a green economy. I would like to repeat what Dr. Holmgren has said. We want to thank the speakers, moderators, organizers, and wish to compliment C4, the Ministry of Forestry, our colleague, the host organizations who have been successful to bringing out issues and highlights of the pertinent aspects of landscape for sustainable green growth in Southeast Asia. 
I just want to conclude with a remarks about the future. First of all, as we are all aware of, though we did, probably didn't discuss a lot, in the next months or so, we will have a presidential election here in Indonesia. There will be change in Indonesia, a change of president, a change of the cabinet, and perhaps other changes will happen. Just like in other democracies, changes will happen on a regular basis, for better, for worse. Now, I'm not a clairvoyant, so I don't know who will be the next president, nor I also don't know what he or she will do. But hearing the statements in the closing plenary, hearing the commitments of the people sitting in front of us here, I got a sense that whatever the next government going to do, on the issue of landscape, on the issue of forest, they will have to hear to the people sitting in front of us. The government has said many times that governments cannot do it alone. What humbles me is also when hearing Ibu Sinta stating that the private sector cannot do it alone. Perhaps the others saying the same thing. No one can do it alone. So because of that, the collective representative in front of us here, all of you also, are the building blocks of the future of Indonesia. I invite you to give advice to the next government on what to do with the sustainable landscape and what will be your contribution to it. As you have said, as you have done in the past and you are committed to do in the future, no president can ignore you. So, I know for sure that in five months' time, not only my boss, the president, can retire with a warm heart, but I can, I can also follow suit in looking into what will be probably the, what you call it, vanguard, the, the guardians of the sustainable landscape not only for Indonesia, but also for Southeast Asia and for the rest of the world. You in your respective field, in your respective contributions, will all bring what we have committed today into a reality. I've seen a new DNA of Indonesia, a new DNA of developing country that aspire for sustainable landscape for green growth in the making. Giving it time, to fully develop, and we will have that future. So, have a safe trip home, drive safely. If you're still staying for a night or two, enjoy Jakarta, and bring back the collective memory that it doesn't matter who will lead a country. What matters is all of us, the constituency of the country, are in agreement that we want to have a green growth country. I thank you, Peter. Thank you.